Doesn't she look snazzy? Look at this. Look at this right there. You're looking. She got the fluorescence. Got go it, the eighties going the 80s. on. It's totally rad for sure. <laughs> this is the way she really used to dress. So uh, she just pulled that out of the closet, and so well, I admit that is the truth. Honestly, this was this was actually mine in high school and college, and yep, yep. And these, <laughs> These were my prom gloves. My mom made these. Your prom 1986, gloves. 1986. Really? I wore this to prom. Yes. These were my pants. I wore to prom. And uh, No. He actually wore those jams. Remember jams? The shorts? Okay. He remembers? wore jams with... Okay, they weren't jams. That's what we Who call remembers? them. Who remembers? No, no. The jams were like regular shorts. Then you had the ones that came down below your knees. They were called clam diggers. Who remembers? Uh, Anybody have that? Yeah, so... I had I jams. Wore, they I did wore cl- I wore clam diggers that went down. That's what I wore to prom with a tuxedo uh, jacket and a t-shirt. <laughs> so that's what I wore to prom in the 80s. Hey. Your ears, what's wrong? Like, I don't know. Is my ear messed up? It's the, it's the headband. That's what it is. Is that better now? Thank you. I actually wore a headband in the 80s, too. I did it, but I would wear different ones, and I put messages on them all the time. Like if I sat next to a pretty girl, like I am right now, I'd be like, "Hey, pretty girl," and I'd write it, and I'd wear it for different classes. Yeah, that's all you got. Hey, pretty girl. If I didn't know her name, yeah, <laughs> if I didn't know her name, <laughs> that way, that way, I wouldn't waste putting her name on there in case, you know. Okay, let's go ahead and keep going. I would put your name on everything, honey. Thank you. <laughs> Grab your Bibles if you have them. Today I've is up in this world. A- you are. I would put your name on everything. Your na- uh, 80s week of finding God in your iPod. Let me say this. I'm going to kind of promo next week. Next week, we're doing 90s week. And then the week after that is like music from today. Uh, 90s week, the song is, uh, it's powerful. It really is. A very powerful song. The words are, uh, I mean, it just has an incredible message. And I want to encourage everyone to, to come back next week because it is going to be, it's just, it's, and I'll tell you this, it's not, it is a powerful, powerful message that goes along with the song. The week after that, we are doing one of the most popular songs uh, on, that's out today. It's a, it's a really fun song. We'll be doing that. Grab your Bibles right now. We're in 80s week. Who thinks 80s are the greatest decade? 80s rock. Woo! No, really, 80s. Woo! 80s are the greatest, greatest music from the 80s. I graduated yes. in 86. She graduated 87. 87. I mean, she's older than me. That's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I married an older or smarter. <laughs> yeah, or both. <laughs> or both. She's a combo. Thank you. Today we're talking about Don't Stop Believing. Don't stop believing, and, and sometimes in life, it can be tough. You know, we're going to try to bring this down to a biblical standpoint. We're not just going to sing 80 songs all day long, but it can be tough um, to, to not to quit believing. I mean, sometimes our, our faith gets tested, and we get tempted, and, and it's easy to quit. It's, it, it becomes easy to quit sometimes, and, and God doesn't want us to quit. Uh, as a matter of fact, not quitting is the greatest way we can get to victory. If you quit, you lose. Everybody look up here. If you quit, you lose. You know, I, I tell stories about my ping pong prowess and how I am a, I am a pretty good ping pong player. And, uh, and I became a good ping pong player because I played at my house. Uh, we had a ping pong table, didn't have much else. We had this, we actually had a piece of plywood and we put it on something and we built a net and we had, my mom went out and bought ping pong paddles. We didn't have much money. And my brother and I would play ping pong all the time. And so we played and he's seven years older than me and he would always beat me. And he beat me and he beat me and he beat me and he's like, I've got to go. And I'm like, well, if you're leaving, that means you quit. And that means I win. And he goes, no, 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 I'm not quitting. And I'm like, okay, so we keep playing. He goes, really, I have to go. And I was like, so you quit. And I win. And I would just play. He would destroy me. And we would play game after game. And I learned how to get good by not quitting. It would have been easier for me to say, I'm not good at this. I'll quit. But I played constantly with him. And I didn't quit. It's the same way. If you want victory in your life, you have to learn to don't stop believing. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to to the book of Galatians chapter 6. Verse 9 says this. It's an incredible verse. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. Now, I think most of us get tired at different times, don't we? When we're going on the path, God wants to go, we're doing things. But the Bible says this, let us not become weary in doing good. Then it goes on and says, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. For at the right time, we will reap a harvest if we do what? If we don't quit. What does it say? It says, we will win in life. We will have victory, we will have success if we don't quit. Don't stop believing. Today we're going to talk about four foundational truths about who God is. We're going to talk about four things that are foundational to who God is. And if we grab hold of these four things, it will help us when we're tempted and and tested and tried and we want to quit, that it will help us to say, no, I have this foundation and I won't quit. Now, 
let me say this. When it comes to foundational truth, some people are like, oh, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. Just because you've heard it before doesn't mean that you've applied it to your life. And we're going to talk about it because you may have heard it and heard it and heard it. God doesn't just want us to hear it. He wants us to hear it, and it goes from our head to our heart. And then it goes from our heart to our mouth. And then it goes from our mouth to change and affect and make a difference in the world. That's what happened. Our mouth to our actions, which make a difference. I remember when I was in high school, my sophomore year of high school, I played on the basketball team. I was the starting point guard. It was me and four seniors. And I wasn't a very good shooter, so I just passed to the guys who were good shooters. I was good at passing, and I was really good at fouling. And uh, we were playing, and we were really good. We had two guys who went on to play college basketball. But I remember one game we were playing, and, and in warm-ups, we're in a tournament. In warm-ups, we looked over at the team we were playing. We were the number one seed. They were the last seed. And we looked over at them. We actually started laughing during warm-ups. We're like, those guys are horrible. They are horrible. Uh, we actually we gave some of their guys nicknames. One guy, he just looked kind of goofy. And who's ever heard of Larry Bird? Larry Bird was an incredible basketball player back in the 80s. Uh, well, we named him Larry the Bird. And, uh, and so we're guarding him like, hey, Larry the Bird. We were just, I mean, we're horrible. And, and so we made fun of him. You were. We were. I was. Uh, so, no, but we were playing in the game. And we got ahead, and, and, and we started to, to not play fundamental basketball. We started throwing behind-your-back passes and doing things that we didn't normally do, and our passes would end up like in the, in the stands. And coach would yell at us, but we didn't quit because we thought we were that good. And, and uh, at, at halftime, we were tied. We went in, and he yelled at us and at halftime. The third quarter, we went ahead of the other team. And then we started doing the goofy stuff again, not the foundation fundamentals. We started doing things because we thought we were really good. And we, the team started coming back on us. And they came back. And Larry the Bird, as time was expiring, hit a half-court shot that cost us the game. And I remember I was out on the court after we were done, and we shook their hands. We didn't want to. We shook their hands, and I was like, I do not want to go to the dressing room because our coach was a great yeller. He knew how to yell. And I thought, if we go to the dressing room, we're going to get yelled at. He's going to cuss us out because that's what happened back then. And, and I remember we walked in the dressing room. He didn't say a word, did not say a word. We got on the bus to drive home. The whole drive, it was about a about 45-minute drive, did not say a word. We got back to our town. We unloaded all of our stuff, did not say a word. I went to school the next day. I had his class. He didn't even speak to me in class. He wouldn't talk to me. I went up and said, hey, coach, and he just ignored me. We got to practice that day, and all the words that he'd been saving up, he shared with us. <laughs> He shared with us that practice. I can't repeat those words to you in church. But he yelled at us. And I remember he said this. He goes, your problem is you're, you think you're better than you are. He said, you need to learn to play fundamental basketball. So that day we practiced for three hours. We did not run a play. We did run, but we did not run a play. We just practiced fundamentals, how to pass, how to dribble, how to, how to, you know, how to play defense. And for that whole week, for three hours, every day, even when we had games, we'd practice for three hours, we'd get on a bus and go to a game. He taught us the fundamentals, and he said, this is what you're going to do. And if you do this, boys, you can be great. And we went that year, and we had an incredible year because we did the fundamentals, the foundation. It's the same way with God. When we do the foundational things of what God says in his word, it will change us forever and will help us to not stop believing. We're going to take a look at four foundational truths about who God is in our life. Well, what about, like, you, you know, you say, well, I, I'm, I'm into the deep things of God. I, I do the deep things of God. Talk about that a little bit. You know, bit. a lot of people, and, and there's nothing wrong with the deep things of God. We, want, we ought to get deeper in God. But here's, the, here's what I find many times. People come up and say, well, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. Well, you know what? Just because you've heard something before doesn't mean you have applied it to your life. Because here's the deal. When you hear it and you apply it and you hear it again, it just makes it stronger in your life. And you're like, well, I'm too deep for that. Well, that means you're really shallow. <laughs> it really does, because you think you have to have this really deep stuff when the truth is you don't do this. I'm in the deep things of God, but I treat people like junk, and I don't show love, and I don't show compassion, and I'm not a good person all the time. God wants us to have the foundational truths that will make our, our relationship with him solid. Yeah. And if we have those, it will change us, and it will change the world around us. Yeah, and I don't think you can hear it enough. You no, know, you can't. The, the foundational things. We, we all need, you know, to hear it again and to hear it again until it really becomes a part of us. That's right. And so we're going to take a look at four things, foundational truths, and who God is and who he says he is in his word. So the first thing, the first foundational truth that we know and that, that the char characteristic of God to be true is that God is good. Yes. God is good all yes. the time. Amen. He is good. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely... 
Your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Yes. Amen. Surely your goodness and love. And that word love, it really, if you go in the Strongs and you look at it, it's translated kindness. So it would read like, surely your goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And, um, you know, David, King David is the one who penned this psalm. And so he himself is a shepherd. So he knows about, he knows a little bit about taking care of sheep and how you have to have meticulous care of sheep. And so he starts out the psalm in verse 1 and 23. And some of you may be familiar with this psalm. It starts out, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And he begins to go through the whole psalm and he tells about how God takes care of him and how God is the greatest shepherd there is and how he takes such meticulous care and has such compassion on his sheep. And he goes through and tells, you know, he restores my soul. He refreshes me. He provides for me. He protects me. And he goes through the whole thing. And this verse is the last one. It's kind of like he sums up the whole psalm in this verse. He says, surely... Surely, not maybe, not, not, you know, oh, maybe yes or no. No, he's confident in his shepherd. He says, surely goodness and kindness will follow me. Yes. And that word follow me, it's really not even strong enough in our English language. It's not exactly what that means. You go back to the original language and it, that word follow me means to hunt something down, to chase it down. So yes. that's what we see. That's the picture that we get of David. He says, he says, surely your goodness and your kindness will chase me down. It's hunting me down all the days of my life. Not just when I get to heaven. No, here and now, all the days of my life. And I find this really interesting where David is when he pens these words. Here's where he is. He is hiding out from his son, Absalom, his son, Absalom, who's usurped the throne from his father, and he sent his enemies, he sent men to look after him, to chase him. So his enemies are chasing David. It's his son. I mean, and Tom mentioned this first service, it's his son. I mean, think about that. Think, just think about the depth of that. Your own son has turned on you, has taken, taken the throne away. Not only that, he is looking out to kill you, and he is searching for you. Yes. So here's David in this middle of this trial, and this horrible thing that he's going through, the storm. And, and what does David do? Does he say, my enemies are chasing me? Not no. in this psalm he doesn't. Who, no. What's chasing him? God's goodness. Yes. God's kindness is chasing him. I mean, how many of us would like that to be our response when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm? That's yeah. me. I want my attitude and my focus, like David, to be on God's goodness. Not all these bad things that are happening, but his goodness. Yes. But honestly, if we be honest with ourselves, how many of us actually do that? Mm. How many of us actually, in the middle of our trial, we say, you know what? God's goodness is chasing me down. Right. David did. You know what? It's hard. Honestly, is it hard sometimes to do yeah. that when you're in the middle of junk and, and awful stuff going on? But that's what we need to realize is that God is good yes. all of the time. You know, it's easy when things are going well to say, well, you know, my finances, they're flowing. You know, I've got it. Everything's all lined up and, and my, my family is flourishing and my, my body is strong and healthy. It's easy to say, you know what? God's goodness is chasing me down, isn't it? It's easy to say then. But what happens when the opposite is true? What happens when we find symptoms of sickness in our body? What happens when the debt is piling up and creditors are calling us? Yeah. What happens when, you know what, our, our children are going the wrong way? You know what, what happens? I mean, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's your friends have turned their back on you for no reason. You know, all those things. It's, it's in those times that God, that our confidence in God and his care of us is tested, isn't it? Yeah. I want to be like David. Lord, in the middle of this trial, I know you're good. I know that your goodness and your kindness is chasing me down even now. Yes. So if you're taking notes, write this down. The circumstances of our lives do not change the goodness of God. doesn't matter what we're going through. doesn't matter if we're in the middle of, tr of a trial or circumstance. God's goodness doesn't change it. That's right. he, he, he is good all the time no matter what we're going through. We need to realize that. You know, my own life and, and Tom and I's lives, I can remember times that, that God led us through a storm and, and some of the darkest nights of our lives. You know, and I remember he, he, he led us down pathways that were clouded over that we couldn't really see and it wasn't clear where this would end up. Yeah. You know what we had to do in that time? We had to trust him that he's good. 
We had to remember the foundational truth that God is good. And you know what happens in the end? In the end, it always ended up for our benefit. I love that about God. Isn't he good? He takes these awful things that we go through, and the Bible says he works everything for our good, according to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's me. That's me. He's going to work everything for my good because I love him, and I'm called according to his purpose. That's all of us. That's everyone of us. Yes, he's the master of that, and he is good all the time. You know, Jesus is clear in John 16, This is him talking. Here's what he says. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. You know what? Write it down. The child of God will have trouble. He said it. He said that. I don't like that part. Do you? <laughs> I don't really like that part. But, but he didn't stop there, did he? What did he say? He said, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He says, be courageous, be strong. Don't be fearful. Take heart, take courage. I have overcome the world. I've been there. I've done it. And because I have been there and I've overcome, that means you have overcome because I live in you. He says, I live in you and I have overcome the world. Don't fear. Take courage, take heart. I love that. He doesn't stop there. He says, I've overcome the world. Amen. And look at John James 1.17. You know, in the middle of... In the middle of our trials and our circumstances, we need to remember that God is good. Look at this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word says he is good. His goodness and his love and his mercy, they chase me down all the days of my life. God is good, and he wants good for our lives. He does. He's for us. He yeah. loves us. He laid down his very life for us. He says the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I love God because he first loved me. Yes. He's, he can be trusted. We can trust that he is good and that, that he wants to work all this out for our good. You know, uh, Tom preached last week on the Zoe life of God. And he has shared this verse, John 10, 10. The first part of it says, the thief comes only but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But look at the last part. But I came, Jesus, he said, I came so that they can have real and eternal life, the Zoe life. Remember that? He talked about the Zoe life of God. If you didn't catch that sermon, go on YouTube and, and, and listen to it because he talks about how we can have real life, eternal life, Zoe life of God, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Yeah. So if you don't get anything else out of this, remember, the devil is the one that comes to steal from us, right? Yeah. And God is good. Yes. I mean, if we can just get that cemented in our hearts and our lives that God is good and the devil is bad, you know what? We've got, we've got it. We've got it, and we've got that foundation we can stand on because it's a firm foundation. God is good. First foundational truth that we need to grab hold of is God is good. How many glad God is a good God? <laughs> That he is a good God. Next thing is this. You're taking notes. You can write this down. God is good and God is able. God is able. See, not only is he good and caring and loving, but he's got the power behind the goodness and the care and the love. God is good and God is able. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 Uh, It says, that is why I am suffering here in prison. Well, why is he suffering? If you look at the verse before, it says, because I am preaching the gospel, that I am being an apostle. He was an apostle. He's taking the word out to the whole world. And he said, because of that, that is why I am suffering here in prison. Let me share this with you. There are times in life where you will go through hardships and struggles. And I've had people who've told me, well, that's not God's will. It's not God's will for your life to go through hard times or to go through struggles. That is so not true. It is in the Bible. You see people who are walking out God's will for their life, and they still went through hardships and troubles. They still went through tough things. The Apostle Paul right here, he said, this is why I'm suffering, not for doing the wrong thing, but for doing God's will. He said, but I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. Let me read that again. For I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until the day of his return. I remember this a long time ago. I memorized it in the old King James. And it says it like this. For I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Let me say it again. For I know, I know him. I don't just know about him. I know him. 
I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. I'm convinced. I'm putting all my chips in that he is what? Able. See, God is able to do it, to keep that which I've committed. I can, what do we commit to him? Well, we're supposed to commit our life to him. So what will he do? He, he will take care of what we've committed, whether it's our finances, whether it's our relationships, whether it's every part of our life, which is what he wants, that he will keep which I've committed unto him against that day until the end of my days. God is able. See, here's the deal. He is good. He loves us. He's the dad who will hug us and love us and wants good for us. But he's also the dad who is full of power and might and ability. Here's the deal. I serve a God. We serve a God who is able to speak. And the universe is formed by the words that come out of his mouth. God is able. We serve a God who is able to make the sun stand still in the sky. So that his armies can continue to fight and win the battle. We serve a God who is able to, to part a sea. And they can walk across on dry ground. Because why? He is able. We serve a God who is able to take a little boy with just a sling and a stone. And defeat a massive warrior. Why? Because he is able. We serve a God who is able to turn water into wine. We serve a God who is able to walk on water. We serve a God who is able to raise the dead back to life. We serve a God who is able. Whenever you feel like stopping, I just can't do it anymore. You're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it with a God who is able on your side and living inside of you. You sit there and like, well, I just can't pay my electric bill. <laughs> I just can't pay it. Let me say something to you. God is able. Let me compare this. Parting the Red Sea. Paying $400 on the electric bill. Isn't it amazing how we get freaked out about stuff that God's sitting there going like, that is not even a big deal. I'm able to take care of that. I'm able... Whether it's being able to pay your bills, whether it's being able to restore a relationship that's been broken, and it's been broken, there's no way it can be healed. God is able. I went to the doctor and they gave me a bad report. God is able. See, we need to quit looking through things with our eyes and start looking through His and through His ability. See, we won't quit believing if we believe that he's good and we believe that he's able to take care of whatever circumstance and situation we're going through. Now, let me say this. Sometimes, sometimes we don't look at his goodness or his ability. We talk about being on the bottom, but when we're on the top, it's just as tempting, it's just as tempting not to acknowledge that he is good. Well, I did that myself. I got that raised myself. I did this myself. Instead of giving him glory and honor, God is able and he is good. Let me look at this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Let me read that again. Now to him who is what? Able. Now to him who is what? Able. It means he has the ability to do what? Immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Imagine. Another version says more than we can think or dream. More than we can think or dream. Who in this room is a dreamer? Raise your hand. Okay, that's everybody. Who in this world is a... God created you to be a dreamer. Who in this room is a dreamer? Raise your hand. Because God created you to be a dreamer. And so what is he able to do? He's able to do immeasurably more than we can think or ask or dream or imagine. And I don't know about you. I am a big dreamer. I, I, I dream things. I mean, I, I really do. I, I'll sit there and especially, you can ask my family, when it comes to buildings... I'll just sit there and I'll go by a building. I'm like, that would make a good church. We may have to make that our church one day. Not, not move here, but it would be an additional church that we would plant or start. And I mean, I look at apartment complexes saying we should own those. I'll drive by daycares thinking, man, we should buy a daycare. Do you know why? So there are a bunch of single moms, can't afford to pay for daycare. We could show them the love of Jesus. I, I look at this. We're buying this building. We've taken almost the whole thing. Look over here. On the other side of this wall, we have another auditorium, which if you look around, we are... We are filling up today, even with the OU loss and the fair. That's like a double whammy. OU loses. People go to the fair. They're just eating corn dogs. They're just eating corn dogs. You should come here and learn about Jesus. But on the other side of this room, we're growing so much. We have another auditorium back there. We can, probably, we can pack 200 more people in there and add another service on Sunday morning. Do you know what? Because he's able. 
I walked back the other day. I was walking back the other day, and I was talking to, I just kind of walk around talking to God. So people see me walking around, they think I'm weird. I'm just walking around, I'm like, God, I never even, I never even thought about this area back here. And he goes, I did. <laughs> Hey, can I say something? You sure it can. says he's he's able to do immeasurably more. Yes. That means without me- does that mean without measure? I think that's what it means. Okay. <laughs> well, think about that. Without measure more. Like you can't even measure it immeasurably more. So what he was talking about, God can do something that you can't even measure yes. above and beyond that. Isn't yeah. that good? Yeah. I take my dreams to God sometimes and then there have been times where I'm like, man, that's too big, Lord. That's too big. And and I just feel like I just feel like when I say God, that's too big, he's just like, Oh, that's so cute, Tom. <laughs> That's really cute. I think you say, no, come on, believe me for more. <laughs> I agree I with that saying. too. But he wants us to, but look at this. That's, that's not the end of the verse. Now to him is able to measure more than we ask or imagine. What? According to the power that is at work within us. According to the power that's work where? Within us. God, you do it. God, you do it. And God's like, I've given you power to do it. So where does it go? We talked about this. It goes, okay, we're talking about foundational truths. Foundational truths go into our head. We hear them in our ears. We hear them. They go to our heart where we believe them and put our life upon them. They come out of our mouth and they are responded by our actions. Yeah, it's like we're speaking to our world. Yes. We're changing our world by the, the words we believe that we speak out. And by the actions you- that we step out and do. See, God wants us to believe and to step out and believe that he is able. See, God's planted dreams, visions inside your heart. And he is good and he is able. Two foundational truths. God is good and God is able. The third foundational truth that we're taking a look at and the attribute of God is that God is close. Yes. It's mm-hmm. a foundational truth. God is close. Take a look at Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Mm-hmm. That's good. You know, you know that God is, he's omnipresent, which means he's, he's, what, he's everywhere all at the same time. It's kind of... Kind of hard for our human minds to grasp that, don't you think? It's true. He's everywhere all at the same time, but he's not near to all those people. Who is he near to? What does that verse say? He says he's near to all who call on him, and not just call on him, but who call on him in truth. truth. Yes. And that just means with a sincere heart, who yes. call on him from a sincere, truthful heart, not a mocking heart, not an insincere heart, but a truthful, sincere yes. heart. You know, sometimes we, we, we don't feel, has everyone ever felt this way? You know, God, I just, just where are you? Where are you? I don't, I don't feel you near me or close to me. Has everyone ever felt that way? Yeah. I know I have. I've certainly felt that way. But the truth is, his word says, he is as near to us as our next whisper calling out to him from a sincere heart. Yes. And that's the truth. Even though he doesn't feel that way, he is there. You know, I, we have five children, and um, I homeschool all of them, and I'm, I'm thankful to God that he allows me to stay home and to be able to do that. I know he's called me to that right now. Um, one is in college, so he's not home as much as the others, but I'm with them all day long. And, and as a mom of, of four that I'm schooling, I can feel pulled in a, a, a thousand different directions. Can anyone else relate to that with just, I mean, with Whether your children? Whether kids or work or anything else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but, okay, so this one, he needs his lunch right now. He's starving. He's going to faint if he doesn't get his, his food. That's the, that's the <laughs> no, truth. Yeah, this one, this one. I am hungry. <laughs> no, not this one. <laughs> okay, I am kind of hungry. Not you. This one. Okay. okay that one. <laughs> but that one needs his food or he's going he's gonna to faint and, 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 you know, just lay, lay it flat out. I'm like, okay, well, this one needs food. This one over here needs um, <clears throat> his math graded. This one over here needs his spelling test done. This one over here, well, he's just got all kind of questions. So you know what? And, you know, questions about life. Mom, why is the sky blue? Mom, why is the grass green? Mom, why, blah, blah, blah. Mom, why is this? Why is this? Ha! Ah! You know, and I just feel like, oh, I'm going to stress out and, and just, you know, I, I feel. Sometimes... That's what made her hair look like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the kids. It was not hairspray. <laughs> That's partly true, just but kidding. no. But... No, but so I, I do. I feel, I feel, st- I, I get stressed sometimes, and sometimes I feel like he's a million miles away. Mm-hmm. And here's what I do when I get that way: I need to remind myself he's just, he's here. All I have to do is call out to him. And you know what? Sometimes I do. Okay, just, just being real, just being honest. And I love my children, and and they're the, a, a joy and a blessing in my life. But sometimes moms need a little bit of quiet time just away from him. So I'll go into the bathroom. It's about the only place I can get to be alone. And even then, that's not a guarantee, right? <laughs> So I, 
Yeah, it's not a guarantee. So I locked the door and, you know, sometimes mom, you know, knocking on the door, <laughs> leave me alone. Yeah, okay. So I love my kids, but yes, I just need some peace and to be able to call out to God. And, and when I do, what happens? He's, he's, he's there. He's there. He's there and his peace washes over me. I get direction. Kim, here's what you need to do. He yeah. gives me his wisdom. He gives me his joy he's close, yeah. so that I can go on and do what I need to do. You know, yes, yeah, sometimes I do hide out from my children. I love them, but honestly, I do hide out from them sometimes. Now they know my hiding spot. No, they know, but, but no, but God is near. And we need to remember that he's close. He's always there. He's just yes. a next, our next breath away. Um, you know, so, so don't base the closeness of God on how you feel. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Never judge God's closeness to you based on your feelings Rather, look at it based on his word. That's a much better word, isn't it? Yes. Our feelings are, man, they come and go. They can be up one time and down the next, but God's word never yes. changes, and we can build our lives on that. Yes. He never changes, and his word said he is near. Look at James 4, 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. You see, it takes us coming near to him. We will never obtain his favor, his mercy, his grace, his help, his deliverance, his protection, his everything that he, that he is and that we need. We have to, what? Call on him, don't we? Yes. We're never going to obtain his favor and help from at a distance. No. He says, draw near unto me, and I will, what happens when we draw near to him? At the same time, he's drawing near to us. Yes. You know, maybe you're out there saying, you know what? I, I want to go to God, but you don't know what I've done. And, and you feel this guilt of your sin weighing you down. I, I, I know I've been there before. You know, God, I just, I feel, I, I, I've sinned against you. You know what? Just be honest with him. That's what a sincere heart is. It's a truth. You know what? He knows it anyway. Yeah. We might as well be honest. And you know what God does when we do that? God, here's what I've done. What does he do? He says, my child. And he grabs us up. He picks us up and he cleans us off and he restores him, he restores us to himself, doesn't he? Not based on anything that I've done. No, it's based all on Jesus. Because none of us are worthy in and of ourselves to do that. But because of what Jesus did, he makes us worthy. Yeah. Because of what he did, how he died for us and rose from the dead, we can come to him with full assurance and confidence. And we can enter into the throne room of God with confidence. So don't let that stop you. Just be, just be honest with him. Just call on him from a sincere heart and he... What does he do? He grabs us and he, and he loves on us. He says, you know what? You're my child. And he'll give you that peace and that help. God is close. Yes. He is close. You know, I remember um, there was a time when I was, you know, in ministry. We were both in ministry. And, and we'd always been told not to let people know and not to, I mean, not to be transparent or real. And, and so anytime we had a problem, we would never tell people. I wouldn't even tell God sometimes when I had a problem. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have a problem. And people taught me if I had a problem, it was all my fault or my sin. And there are times where it's true. There are times where we have problems where it is our sin or, or it's our stupid. <laughs> you know, we do stupid stuff sometimes. Who agrees with that? And, and it causes us to get into trouble. Uh, and if it's our sin, what do we need to do? If it's our sin that causes us to get into trouble, we need to do a thing called repenting. I know that's not a word we hear very much. Repent. What does repent mean? Repent doesn't mean you go lay on the ground for 14 hours and you have to cry. Here's what repent literally means. It means you turn around. Say I'm going this direction. And that's not the direction I should go. To repent means that I turn around and I turn my back on what I used to do and the way I used to live and I go this direction and I'm going toward Christ and I'm going toward God. Now there are times where, wherever you go through a time of repentance where you feel broken. Let me say this. Brokenness is not a bad place where you are broken and you realize, brokenness means this, you get to a place where you realize, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own. And I want to quit because I'm trying to do this on my own. A place of brokenness can be the healthiest place you can be. If in your brokenness, you turn from this and turn to this. If in your brokenness you say, I don't want to live in sin, I don't want to live for myself, but I want to live for Christ, in that moment where you repent and you're broken, God will take that brokenness. And he'll make brokenness into something beautiful. And he will be close. There have been times where, man, the lowest times of my life, when the worst things have happened in my life, where I felt the presence of God the closest. Don't ever forget those times. Value those times. Here's the next thought is this. We know God is good. God is able. God is close. The last one is this. God is, God is faithful. God is faithful. This is an important one. This is a huge one. God is faithful. 
Psalm chapter 36, verse 5, it says, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. How faithful is God? His faithfulness stretches to the skies. His faithfulness is endless. Go ahead in Psalm chapter 145, verse 13 and 14. This is your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Listen to this. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises. The Lord is faithful to all of his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all those who are bowed down. What does it mean when God says he's faithful? Here's what it means. It means that he will keep his word. He will do what he said he was going to do. If God said it, he will do it, and he is faithful to do that. It means he will never leave your side. It means when you need him and you call out to him, he has not disappeared. Even when you're going this direction, you know where God is? God is right there waiting for you to take a moment to turn around this way. And then he will be faithful to be there every single time. When everyone else has left you, he will never leave you. Why? Because he is faithful. You may have people that have left you and it's scarred you and it's damaged you. The problem is you have put your faith in people sometimes that are not faithful. And people will let you down no matter how good they are. But the one who is faithful will never let you down. And so whenever you feel like quitting, recognize this. God, you are good. You are able. You are close. And you will never leave my side. Because you were faithful. See, that's what God is for us. And whenever we feel like quitting, if we realize these truths, we won't quit. Man, it's been in my my lowest valleys, the lowest times of my life, that I would never trade what God did in those times. When I saw him just walk out his faithfulness and his ability and his goodness, And his closeness during times when everything seemed to be falling apart. Now, in the the middle of it, I'd been like, yeah, I want out of this right now. (laughs) But when you don't stop believing, you get the victory. And with the greatest battles that you face, the greatest battles you face, when you don't stop believing, end with the greatest victories. If you don't let go of his faithfulness. And he will not let go of you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are good. God, we thank you that you are able. God, we thank you that you are close. And we thank you, God, that you are faithful. We thank you for those things, Lord. We thank you for them today. We thank you for them in our lives. We thank you for you that you would move among us. I read the verse in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, where it says, I know, I know in whom I have believed. I know him. I know in whom I have believed. Doesn't just mean I know about him. It's not talking about knowledge of him. It's talking about relationship with him. I know. I know in whom I have believed. I know him. I know the God who spoke and created the heavens and the earth. I know him. See, that's what makes the biggest difference. The first step of saying, I know him. And if you're here today and your heart is far from him, if you're here today and you've never come to know him, today make a choice and decision. You want joy and you want peace and you want all these things in your life. The first step is to know him. The first step is to come into relationship with him. And that is what he wants.